This is the time to worship. Let's stand up together and give God our praise this morning. Our God is the lion. Our God is the lamb who sacrificed for our sins. Let's sing these words together. The lion and the lamb. Put your hands together. Come on. That Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Sing to him. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Welcome to First Christian Church of Johnson City. We are so glad you're here with us this morning, especially if you're a guest. This is such a great Sunday to come visit us uh, because we're actually continuing our series on Jesus of Nazareth, CPA. 
So this is our second visit to this new CPA in town, um, and we're just looking to him for guidance in how we lead our families' lives and how to use our finances. So welcome with us this morning. John, uh, First Christian Church Johnson City is one church in two locations, here and downstairs in the CLC, over six service times. Um, and we just invite you to continue to worship with us this morning. Uh, this next song is a new one we introduced last week. It's called The Way. And the chorus is very simple. It is a scripture verse, and it just says, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't always believe that. So when I come here and I sing that, it's practice. And sometimes it's a reminder that that is who Jesus is. So will you sing along with us this morning? Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe that you are the way, the truth.
way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Go ahead and be seated if you would. He, he allows us to overcome things in our lives because he overcame the grave. Sing with us. Jesus, the overcomer. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the risen one has overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the risen one has overcome. Now the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry. Shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one has overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. Stand back up with us if you would, and Scott's going to lead us in a song we all know, uh, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound of those very words, and he alone is our Savior and our protector. Sing with us.
about to come to our time of offering and as we do we like to uh, to remember why we give and we give as an act of worship and in response to God's faithfulness in our lives and in our church and at FCC we strive to steward these offerings well and, and one of the ways that we try to do that is through supporting outreach efforts locally nationally and globally and so I'm so happy to be able to introduce you all to Jeff and Monica Fife. They are missionaries with us, FCC supported missionaries to Brazil. They lead a ministry called Brazil River of Life. And Jeff and Monica and their family have a kiosk in the atrium. They'll be there after services and again this evening. Um, well, their son will be here this evening. And uh, we just hope that you stop by and get to know their ministry a little bit. And in that same vein, I'm going to ask Jeff and Monica a few questions just so that we can begin that learning process. Uh, so Jeff and Monica, Brazil River of Life that you lead does so many different things. Could you tell us just a few of those um, kind of efforts that you all are engaged in with the ministry? Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, it's always great to come back to First Christian Church since we did the uh, help here for five years when I was doing my master's degree. But Brazil River Life is just a base in Brazil. We work with all the Portuguese-speaking countries in the world. Portuguese is the fifth uh, language most spoken in the world and is the, the fifth uh, largest population in the world. And we work uh, in several locations and we work through evangelism, we work with discipleship, we have a hands-on Bible college locally at uh, almost every, the, every church that we have planted. Uh, we have urban ministries and we plant a lot of churches. So, um, we've been supporting Brazil River of Life for a while now. What are some of the different efforts that the ministry has engaged in that First Christian's been able to, to partner with you all on? Uh, in Brazil, uh, First Christian Church helped us plant a church in 2005 in Campo Limpo Paulista, 2010 in Jundiaí, 2015 in Recife, every five years. We're getting ready for another one, so get ready. And... Uh, in Mozambique, uh, we, we build a, a water dam that's about the size of this, this building here that uh, feeds over 10,000 people with water. And uh, First Christian Church helped us build that. And also the, the great school that we have has over 1,000 students from first to seventh grade. 98% of our students are Muslims. Uh, and uh, the desks that they sit and uh, they study on uh, were paid by First Christian Church. So we are thankful for... Uh, your generosity. Jeff, thank you so much. And I just, to reiterate the w one thing I shared earlier with some folks, just how it made such an impact on me hearing that while Brazil, River of Life, has Brazil in the name, their ministry impacts places globally. And uh, just to know that there are so many Portuguese-speaking people, not just in Latin America, but on the continent of Africa, and that what Jeff and Monica and their sons and the ministry there is doing, they're, they're impacting not just the continent of South America, but really places across the world. So Jeff is gonna pray for our offering now. Thank you, just one more thing. This month we planted a, a 100 church in Mozambique. Almost 4,000 Muslims baptized into Christ already in Mozambique. So praise the Lord for First Christian Church. Let us pray. Father. We thank you for your generosity of sending your son, Jesus Christ, to give his life for us. Thank you for the opportunity of being generous and giving into uh, your kingdom. Father, thank you for First Christian Church and all it represents to the world, not only to the Portuguese world, but all the other ministries and missions they support throughout the globe. It's the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church. I'm Alexander. And here are some of the things that are coming up this week that you won't want to miss. 
The next college lunch is next Sunday in the round room at 12 p.m. If you're a college student, 18 to 25 year old, or even a high school senior, you're invited to enjoy this home cooked meal, play some games, and just hang out and have fun. All Operation Christmas Child boxes need to be filled and returned today. Then on Wednesday, you're welcome to come help us load up the boxes to be shipped. We'll meet in the atrium at 11 a.m. and lunch will be served. If you contact Kathy Smith, you can get additional details. One of the cool things about our DNA here at FCC is that we are all about loving people. We've got a ton of outreach ministries that help us show our love for God, His church, and this city. And one of the neat ministries that we have is the Handyman Ministry. If you've got a small repair or need help with a around the house light task, for instance, pulling weeds or repairing appliances, we've got people in this church who want to help you. Feel free to fill out a form at our outreach kiosk or online. That's about it for now. As always, you can check out our bulletin or the website for more information on other events like TCTC that's coming up after the new year, serving at World Cafe over at ETSU, and the next Seniors Ministry Day Trip. Also, head to our Facebook and Twitter to keep up with everything that's going on around here during the week. Have a great day and enjoy this fall weather. That uh, the handyman ministry is a great, a great thing we sponsor here at First Christian Church. I've actually had many people call me a handyman before. <laughs> Think about that at lunch. You'll figure that out. Okay. <laughs> this morning, it's been wonderful to praise him and just worship him together. I want to ask you to stand one last time with us this morning as we sing these words to prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper this morning. Scott's going to lead us. Lord, I need you every hour of every day.
with you. As we come to our time of communion, we come to our communion in need. We need our Savior. But not in the way that we say we need other things. Usually, when we talk about what we need, we're talking about things we find valuable, right? And value on this earth is calculated by usually things that are scarce, right? Or maybe in high demand, those things are valuable. And things lack value when they're easy to come by and freely given in abundance. That's how our economy works, but God's economy is quite different. We don't need God because God is hard to come by. In fact, the Bible teaches that God is with us. And it's not that we need grace because it's hard to find. In fact, it's freely given, and there's no scarcity of it. The Bible teaches that God's grace is free. And that's part of what makes it valuable because it can be found in abundance and without our need to seek it. We need it because it gives us life. In fact, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. The kind of bread that you eat and you never go hungry again. And Jesus calls himself the living water. The kind of water that you drink, you never go thirsty again. We need what God has to offer because his world is completely different than ours. And that's a good thing. This meal we are about to take is a flicker of the grand show of life that God has for his believers in heaven. Where in this place we find no need because God is willing to provide all things for his people in this life and the next. Not because it's scarce, but because it can be found in abundance. Let us pray. God, teach us to see the world the way you see it and believe the teachings because you believed it and practice with our lives what you would practice if you were in our shoes. Let this meal be a space where we are together and find no difference. Let this be a sample of the banquet we will one day have together with all believers in heaven. In your name I pray, amen.
church, it is great to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus, one of the pastors here. And if you're a guest with us today, we are so glad that you're here. You're in the right place. I hope that you've already been blessed. We are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Uh, well, in just a minute, we're going to jump into the second message of our series, Jesus of Nazareth CPA. Uh, but before I do that, uh, there are two other things we want to do. Uh, one of those is about today, and the other one is about Christmas. And depending on how you're wired up, you're either really glad we're already talking about Christmas, or you're like, you're thinking it's not even Thanksgiving. But sorry, we got to talk about it. So, um, but the first thing we got to talk about is today. Uh, some of you, probably many of you do know, but some of you might not know that today is the 100th celebration of Armistice Day which is a word I can't say, even though it's my sixth try today, um, but which is why I'm glad we eventually renamed it Veterans Day, because that is a word I can say. But sure enough, a hundred years ago today, November 11th, 1918, uh, was when they signed the treaty to end World War I, and um, of course immediately that day became a day of thanksgiving and remembrance, uh, for our veterans, and, you know, at the time, it was the war that ended, would end all wars, but as we know, it did not, and so it has become a day of remembering not just veterans of World War I, but all of our veterans. I'm glad for Veterans Day. Uh, you know, God's Word teaches us uh, about how Christians love their country, whether they're in this country or some other country. God's Word teaches that our country is not our first love, that is Christ. And that the kingdoms we live in here on earth are not even our first kingdom. Our first kingdom is heaven. We are citizens first of heaven. God's word teaches that wherever we reside here on earth, we are strangers there. We are foreigners in the realms of humans because our true home is in the kingdom of heaven. But as strangers in the name of Christ, we are called to love the place and the people where God has put us. We are called to be a sacrificial blessing to the nations and cities that we live in. Here's how Jeremiah explained it to God's people when they were in exile in Babylon. He said, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I am so grateful for our veterans because this is the very thing they have done. They have sacrificed their safety and comfort in order to seek the peace and prosperity of the land and nation to which God has brought them. They have not just prayed but lived for the prosperity of that place trusting that as God caused it to prosper, they too would prosper. So I'm just thrilled for a chance to remember and praise our veterans. Uh, there are lots of super important ways to do that. There was a parade yesterday. There'll be memorial ceremonies throughout the day today. Uh, but here, uh, probably the most fitting way we can do that is to pray for our veterans. And we're actually going to do that twice today. Um, Right now, in the service, I'm going to pray, and then we're also, Gary Thomas, who's a veteran of the Navy, is going to close our service in prayer. But right now, if you would, if you're a, a veteran worshiping with us today, I'd love to pray a prayer of blessing over your life. And if you would, I'd love it if you would stand so that we can know you're here. I know we've got some with us today. Uh, you don't have to stand if you don't want to, but if you'd be willing to stand, I'd love it so that I could pray a blessing over your life. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I'm so grateful for these who have taken to heart the words of Jeremiah, and they have sought to work for the peace and prosperity of the land to which you have brought them. 
I thank you that as followers of the one true king, they have sought to live as a blessing among the kingdoms of this world. And that I, we, all benefit from the prosperity and peace that has come through their efforts. Now, God, I ask that you would bless them, that they would know the peace and prosperity that they have helped to maintain, and that they would most especially know you, and know that you have secured for them an eternal peace and overwhelming prosperity in the kingdom that you will once establish by your glorious hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Well, that was a word about today. And now a quick little word about Christmas. Hopefully in the back of the pew in front of you, you can find a little card that looks like this. I'd love for you to grab one. If by any chance your pew has been emptied of them, we've got more on the way out. I hope you'll grab one. I want everyone to leave here with one of these because this card is a reminder of some of the strategic ways we can be working for the advancement of God's kingdom over the next couple of months. Christmas is a wonderfully strategic opportunity for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with our friends and neighbors. You know people, you know people who will accept an invitation to church around Christmas who wouldn't accept it any other time, perhaps. So don't miss the opportunity that Christmas provides. We've got three ideas for you. We'd love for lots of people to participate in this. Number one, since our theme is Let There Be Light, we would love for lots of people to go crazy decorating their yards this year. Or if you live in a dorm, decorate your dorm room. Or if you live in an apartment, decorate your patio or your apartment door or something like that. Go crazy with the de decorations and then grab one of these signs. We've got them at the connection kiosks, different places around the church. We'll print more if we run out. Grab one of these signs, put it up in your yard. It just says, for everyone, First Christian Church. It's got our website on there. Put it up in your yard so when people go by and see your Christmas lights, they'll recognize those lights are an invitation to church. So that's thing one. Number two, we're challenging, as we've done the last couple years, as many of us as possible, host a party in your home and invite people that you know and you love and God's love and God loves them, but they don't know God loves them, okay? Invite them to your house, give them some eggnog, invite them to church so that they can know that they are loved by God. Number three uh, is just the challenge. Start praying now. Who does God want you to invite to one of our Christmas Eve services. In a couple weeks, we'll share the details of that, but I forget if we're going to have seven or eight or something. We're going to have a ton of Christmas Eve services, so everybody will have a chance to come. So that way, if you call a friend and they're like, oh, I go to grandma's in the night, you'll say, awesome, come with me in the morning. Or, oh, I've got to do this. You know, great, come with me then. Uh, we've got tons of services, so you can invite some people. So, Take one of these with you, please. Put it in your pocketbook, stuff in your Bible, put it in your back pocket. Don't forget all the strategic ways uh, we can uh, share the light of Christ this Christmas. All right, let's jump into our message. All right, so we've got this new CPA. His name is Jesus, and we're so glad he's here because so many of us struggle with our finances. It, it's a problem in some of our marriages, in our relationships. It's holding us back from the dreams we think God has for us and the strategies we think God wants us to pursue in our life. And we're trying to figure out how to follow God in this way. And so this new CPA shows up and he says, okay, we're going to have, have, have a couple sessions and I'm going to teach you some new principles about how you can follow God with your finances. Last week we looked at this verse. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and increase your store of seed, will enlarge the harvest, enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We talked last week in session one with our new CPA about a few important truths. Number one, God owns everything. 
Number two, you are a steward of God's wealth. You're, you're a manager of God's money, and you're supposed to manage it according to God's priorities. And number three, we talked about this principle. God will provide for you all that you need so that you can abound in the good works God has planned for your life. That was message, that was series one, I mean, lesson one. If you missed it, uh, check it out online, pick up a CD, because everything we're going to say today builds from that core principle. God owns everything. There is no stuff that is stuff that is not God's stuff. If you think you have stuff, it's either not stuff or it's God's stuff, because all stuff is God's stuff, right? God owns everything. You're a steward of what God owns. And this week, we're going to talk about this really simple principle. Ready? A steward needs a strategy. You can't be a good steward of God's wealth without a strategy for your stewardship. In fact, Jesus teaches us that just we need a strategy for every aspect of our discipleship. He, he compares following him to building a tower. He says nobody starts building a tower without making sure they've got the plans and the money and the stuff to do it. Otherwise, you get half a tower built, and then you quit, and everybody makes fun of you. And he says the same thing is true about following me. You need a strategy. And so well, we've talked about this before, actually. We, talk about, we want a strategy for our prayer life and a strategy for reading scripture and a strategy for evangelism right here. Have somebody over for a party. Invite them to church, okay? Well, this need to be strategic in order to maximize our discipleship applies to our stewardship of God's wealth as well. In fact, for many of us, one of the most important decisions we need to make about how we manage God's wealth is the move from being spontaneous to being strategic. I mean, think about this with our spending, right? Think of all the foolish things we do when our spending is spontaneous, right? This is why it's dangerous for me to go to Target, right? I go in for two tubes of toothpaste. I go out with two buggies full of stuff I don't want. It costs $300, and I don't know where it went. It's because, see, I went in with a strategy, but halfway through, I abandoned my strategy and started being spontaneous, and bad things happened when you spend money spontaneously, right? I mean, when, when it comes to spending, what we call a spending strategy, we call that a budget, Right? And a lot of us know we probably could use a budget. Here's the thing, just real quickly about budgets that I like. When you have a budget, your spending reflects your values. When you don't have a budget, your spending reflects your circumstance. Right? You look back at your credit card statement or your checkbook and, oh my goodness, I spent $700 at fast food. Why did I spend that much money on restaurants this month? Oh, well, I was busy the whole time and never packed a lunch, blah, blah, blah. When, you, when, you, when, you, when your spending is spontaneous, your spending reflects your circumstances. If you want your spending to reflect your values, you've got to have a strategy. You've got to have a budget. You spend according to a budget at the end of the month. Oh, yeah, I spent this much on this and this much on this because that was how much I valued these things. That was intentional. That was on purpose. Same thing with saving. Again, nobody ever saved successfully spontaneously. You know, nobody ever wakes up one morning and says, you know, I think today I'll save $100. And then the next time I think of it, I'll save 100 more. That is not how you save money if you want to save money effectively, you've got to save money strategically. I remember when Betsy and I were first kind of starting out in life, getting first paychecks, um, we sat down with a financial planner guy who was a member of the church we were attending at the time and just said, we're so confused. We got all these things we're trying to figure out. And, and in particular, we were trying to figure out how to save for retirement, you know, and like, all these things. We got a 401k and a 403b and Roth IRA and all these different things. Which, and, and I was fine. I said, which one is the best one? And he said a most interesting thing. He said, um, okay, in a second, I'll tell you which one I think is best for your circumstance. He said, but the main lesson is this. The best strategy for saving is the one you'll actually do. That's the best one. Whatever one makes it the easiest for you to systematically set aside some of your income into long-term savings, do that strategy. And then we'll talk about what to do with it after that. And that was super helpful for me because it was just a reminder of the stark difference 
between spontaneity and strategy. And I think when it comes to saving, we all just get it. If you're trying to save spontaneously, you aren't saving. You're either saving strategically or you're not saving at all. What's so interesting, though, is though we know this when it comes to our spending and we know this when it comes to our saving, I meet many people who think that when it comes to generosity, that somehow spontaneous is better than strategic. That the, the best way to give is to kind of wait till something tugs on your heartstrings and then give a little bit or wait till there's a special project and you'll give to that or if one morning at church you feel especially guilty, you'll give to that or something like that. That somehow spontaneous generosity is the best kind of generosity and strategic generosity is somehow not so good. What's interesting though is the Bible, though it includes examples of spontaneous generosity, and it celebrates examples of spontaneous generosity, when it teaches about generosity, it always teaches strategic generosity. We see this in the Old Testament. The Old Testament law included careful and complicated laws about generosity. Uh, to go into them, explain them all now, would be well beyond the scope of this message. Uh, the core of it was this thing called a tithe, a, a giving 10% of everything you made, but sometimes there was a double tithe, and some settings there were other kinds of offerings. It was complicated. But there are two principles that are kind of present in all of the Old Testament laws about generosity that are worth us noticing. The first is the principle of proportional giving. All the Old Testament laws about generosity were in proportion to income. The, the core commitment of generosity in the Old Testament was this thing called a tithe. Every harvest you ever harvested, every land, piece of land you ever sold, every income you ever made from a job, 10% of it went to God as a gift. And this principle of proportional giving is found in all the Old Testament laws about generosity. The second principle that's in all the Old Testament laws about generosity is the principle of the first fruits. This is simple. It just means that generosity comes first. So many of us who practice spontaneous generosity, our habit is first we'll pay our bills and then we'll pay our taxes and then we'll buy groceries and then we'll, you know, have a date night and then we'll, you know, upkeep the house and then if there's any money left over, we might give that to the purposes of God. This is kind of the leftover strategy of generosity. But the Old Testament law never has any accommodation for the leftover strategy of generosity. The Old Testament law, all the gifts that were expected of God's people were always given first. And these two principles, proportional giving, starting with the tithe, and the principle of first fruits, generosity to God, always comes first, are all throughout God's law about generosity. Now, as Christians, we're in an interesting position. We are no longer under the law. All those who are in Christ, the requirements of the law have been fulfilled for us by Christ. We have been freed from the law, and the law as law is no longer law for us. Nothing we can do, no law we can keep, can earn or add to our status with God. Therefore, in Christ, as God's beloved sons and daughters, we are set free from the law. However, when the New Testament talks about, about giving, about generosity, these two principles, proportional giving and generosity first, are always present. The law as law has been fulfilled, but these principles, generosity first and proportional giving, are consistently taught throughout the New Testament. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Do you see right there how both those principles are present? First of all, Paul says, on the first day of every week, set aside what you're going to give. Before you pay bills, before you pay taxes, before you rent a house, before you buy groceries, 
Set aside what you intend to give. Give from the first fruits of your income. Generosity first. But then, it's also generosity is intended to be proportional to our income. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And these two principles, I'm quite convinced, are the foundation of a Christian approach to generosity. These two principles, generosity comes first, and we give in proportion to our income. We, of, remember, are the stewards of God's wealth. All that we have is God's, and for us, it is just to ask this question, God, what should I do with your money? And from top to bottom, beginning to end, God's word is clear. The first thing we do to God's money is we give to the work of God's people, and we give in proportion to our income. I'm quite convinced that making a decision to put generosity first strategically and to systematically give in proportion to your income is the foundation of a life lived with God's priorities in mind. It's the foundation of a life lived that has full stewardship of all of your, all of God's wealth that God has put into your hands. Now, I know when I say this, some of you are worried that this is me coming after your pocketbook or trying to get your money, but I promise you, the reason I teach these principles is not because I want your money. The reason I teach you what I believe is in God's Word and I challenge you to obey God's Word is not because we want your money here at this church, but it's because we want you to experience the blessing that comes from obedience to God. Paul writes to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's what we talked about last week, right? That wealth itself is a spiritual risk because we might put our trust in our wealth. Paul says, instead, don't put your hope in your wealth. Put your hope in the one who provides all wealth. He goes on, command them to be good, to, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. It's, I really believe it. If you want to take hold of the life that is truly life, then put generosity first. And give strategically in proportion to your income. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. I was preaching last week, you know, let, you know, beginning this series on finances. And after one of the messages, a member of the church came up and pulled me aside and said, Ethan, could we meet together this week? If you're going to be talking about finances for the next couple weeks, I'd really like to meet with you first. I, of course, said yes. You know, I meet with anybody. If you ever want to meet, let me know. We'll meet. Uh, so I said, sure. We scheduled the meeting for Wednesday. And I, I didn't know exactly what I was walking into. You know, was it going to be a criticism or a concern or something like that? I didn't know. And so I sat down and she said, I just want you to know my story. I said, okay, what's your story? She said, I got married when I was still in college, and I don't know exactly, but I'm guessing that's 40 or 50 years ago. She said, I got married when I was in college, and she said, um, we were poor, of course, didn't have any money, two college students. One of the first decisions we made as a married couple was our decision about what our generosity was going to look like. And we talked about it, and we decided that we were going to, even though we didn't have much money, with every dime we ever made, the first thing we were going to do was give 10% of it to the church. We were going to tithe to the church. You see, they knew they were stewards, and they knew that stewards need a strategy, and for them, their strategy was going to be to put a floor on their generosity. They would never let their generosity go below that commitment. She went on to say, Ethan, you just, I just can't believe 
how God has blessed us as a result of that decision. She, she began to tell me stories of times when money was tight and they weren't sure how it would all work out and they didn't know where to make it and bills were coming and they, just, and they had tough decisions. They had to kind of reaffirm, is this still who we are? Is this still what we do? Do we still put generosity first? Do we still give in proportion to our income? Is this still who we are? And they would reaffirm their commitment and then out of the blue, There'd be a little extra work for him on a weekend he hadn't expected, or she would have a little way to make a little money that they didn't see coming, and, and God would always meet their needs again and again. And she just told all these stories of a lifetime of little miracles, and she told them about her family and now her kids' families that are experiencing just a lifetime of little miracles. And the thing is, this, here in the story, I wasn't even shocked, because I just want to tell you, I've stirred that, heard that story dozens and dozens of times in my life. In fact, everybody I know who has tithed their whole life long can tell you a story of a lifetime of little miracles, of God making a way where they didn't expect it. In fact, somebody just stopped me just after the last service. They just stopped me and said, Ethan, I have to tell you my story. We made a commitment beyond our tithe. We just felt we had to make this commitment to a missionary, and we did. it was more money than we had. We didn't know where it was going to come. And right before we'd promised to send the check, money we'd never imagined would come our way it came up and it allowed us to keep our commitment, and we had no idea. And the thing is, I was excited for her, but I wasn't even surprised, because I've seen that story thousands, well, no, literally in my life, I know I've seen it hundreds of times in my life, and hundreds upon hundreds in the lives of people I know. This story of people deciding to live as a steward of God's wealth instead of their own wealth to put generosity first and practice proportional giving as a strategic discipline, leading to just the overflow of miracles in their life. It's just, it's just common. Now, I want to be clear. The miracles aren't always financial. I'm not saying you tithe, you'll get rich. God doesn't work like that. That's not the game we're playing. But I am saying, if you decide to manage your money as God's steward, God will transform your life slowly but surely through the discipline of generosity into the likeness of Christ. And God will meet your needs. God does it time and time again. Sometimes people ask me, Ethan, why do you tithe? That was a part of the Old Testament. That was the law. Absolutely it was. There is no law that requires you to tithe. You aren't more saved if you tithe, okay? It doesn't make God love you anymore if you tithe. For me, the decision's always been pretty simple. First of all, the math is really easy on tithing, so that's nice, you know? Secondly, it's what God's people have always done, so why not keep up the trend? But the main reason Betsy and I do it is sort of something like this. We figure if God's people who didn't know about the blood of Jesus Christ, who didn't know about his resurrection, who didn't know about mercy and salvation for all people, who didn't know about the promise that God has for those of us who are in Christ, if they didn't know all that and still could joyfully give 10% of everything they made just off the top, first thing back to God, that seems like a good place for us to start. And who knows how God will teach us to be more generous than that. I will say, uh, like a lot of you all in the church, uh, Betsy and I are boringly strategic about it. We do it through online giving. The very day a checkbook hits the bank account, online giving goes out the door. I haven't put money in an offering plate in years. I, and I never do it because it just happens automatically. And, and on, on the one hand, that's boring. We never have to think about it. On the other hand, what it means is there's a floor to our generosity. There's a, there's a, we will never be less generous than that. And God may prompt us to be more generous. and may, We still do spontaneous generosity, but we've put a floor on it. And what it does is it reorients every budget conversation you ever make. Every time you sit down to spend God's money, you remember it's God's money because the first thing you do with God's money is give some of it back to God. And the rest you manage for God's purposes. I'm not saying that has to be your strategy, but here's what I do know. A good steward has a strategy. And if you're a steward of God's money, I, I just would challenge you, what's your strategy for generosity? Let me be super practical, wrap things up with a couple real strategic things. Uh, number one, I'll just say this. Um, if you are just getting started financially, or if you need a fresh start financially to reorient the way you handle your money as a steward of God's wealth rather than as an owner of your own stuff, I would just suggest... I think you ought to give tithing a try. 
Uh, I think it's worth trying. I, I, really, I know that in this church, we've got hundreds of people that can testify. You ask somebody, have you ever tried it? You're gonna, you'll ask three people. You'll find somebody who'll say, oh my goodness, I would never not do it. I can't imagine not doing it because of how God has used it to bless my life. And I'll just say, I think you ought to give it a try. 10% of everything you make, just give it. If any part of you, if for one second you're worried, I'm saying that because I want to increase the offerings to this church. If, if that cross, if you're like, oh, that's the only reason he's saying it. If that worries you at all, then just give the extra money to some different church. Okay, do the math. What would it look like for you to tithe to God's church and you give all the extra money to some other church and bless them because I'm not asking you to tithe because we need money. God will always give this church the money that we need. God takes care of this church's finances. I'm asking you to tithe because you need to tithe. It will reorient your life toward God and God's purposes, and God will bless you through it. I just know God will, and you'll have your own miracle story, and I can just tell you so many, just crazy ones, in my own life and in friends' lives. It's amazing. Second thing I'll say is this. Uh, some of you are telling me that, Ethan, we're young, we're just getting started, we're in our first job, we don't make a lot of money, and it's really hard for us. We'll do it when we make more money. And I'm telling you, actually, no, the easiest time to start is now when you're broke, okay? Because then it's really not that much, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's, easy, it's a lot easier to tithe on less money than more. Uh, in fact, some of you who make more, tithing is barely cutting. You know, you give you, you away proportional giving. You might want to give away more than a tithe. But for those of you just getting started, here's a trick for you. Ready? If you maybe you're in your first job, some of you are in your first job, you're about to start your first job. Here's your trick. Okay, from your very first paycheck, give 10% to the church, save 10% in long-term savings, and budget around 80%. Budget with what's left over. Give first, save second, budget with what's left over. Yes, you'll have to live in a smaller apartment and buy a junkier car and, you know, eat out less. I get that. But if you start that from day one, you'll hardly even, it will hardly even qualify as sacrificial giving. You'll almost never notice. And then you'll get a raise and you'll spend that 80% will grow as you make more. But you'll always make sure you've kept a floor on your generosity. And you've kept a floor on your savings. That's just super practical. Again, there's no law around this. Don't feel guilty if that's not what you're doing. You're saved by grace, not by works. I'm just saying if you want to begin to live as a steward, this could be a strategy you could use. Last thing, I'll repeat this, said this last week. A lot of us, we want to live as stewards of God's money, but we are so confused and in over our head financially, we are just under it, and we got no clue where to start, and we need some smart people who get finances to sit with us and teach us. If that's you, we got a class. Tommy and Kay Greer are leading it. As I said last week, Tommy is an actual CPA, not just a spiritual CPA. Uh, you got to check. It's great stuff. Uh, it meets at 11 a.m., but since that's happening right now, we have another class that meets at 6.20 Sunday nights in room 104B, which is basically that way down the hall. You'll find it 6.20 tonight. If you want to follow God with your finances, but you're just overwhelmed and don't know where to get started, you come to this class. They will help you out. All right, let me close in prayer for us. Gracious God, you have been so generous to us. Teach us to mirror that generosity in our lives. Teach us to be strategic stewards, committed to faithfully handling your wealth, which you have placed in our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I invite you now to stand. We conclude our worship with a song of commitment, dedicating our lives as God's servants. If you need to join the church or give your life to Christ through baptism, you can come forward and do that. If you just need prayer today, i got a friend here in front of the piano. I'd love to pray for you. Just come on up and let us pray for you. Let's sing together. Sing those words that we started our service with this morning. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah, and He is the Lamb, sacrificed for our sins.
Gary Thomas is here. He's a veteran of the Navy, and he's going to be closing us in prayer today. Pray with me, please. Now, Father, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate Veterans Day as we honor all those who have served and who are serving our country. I pray for the veterans here today, Lord, and thank them for their service to our country. I thank you for watching over them and bringing them safely home. I also pray for those here today who currently have loved ones serving in the armed forces. I pray that they would entrust their loved ones to your care. And Lord, I pray especially that you would grant physical and emotional safety to those serving, especially the ones who are in harm's way. But more importantly, Lord, I pray for their relationship with you. For those who do not know you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their need to be rescued, not just from physical harm, but from an eternal separation from you. I pray that they would put their faith and trust in you as Savior and Lord of their lives. And lastly, Lord, I pray for any here today who may have lost loved ones while serving our country. I pray that you would comfort them with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, give them the strength to live their lives in such a way that they will bring honor to you and to their loved ones. And Lord, we here at First Christian, as your church at First Christian, it's our desire that we, along with those who are currently serving our country, will declare along with what the psalmist said when he said, your truth shall be our shield and buckler. We shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the era or bullet that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. We will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. And we pray all these things in the name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, have a great week and be generous.